Luke 15 this morning in your Bible. Luke 15, I'm going to start with verse number 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. <coughs> and not, so, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask you, Lord, to bless the service this morning. We pray, O oh God, that you would bless this message, O oh Lord, and use it to do thy will. Empty me, O oh God, of self. Help me, Lord, to lift up thy name. Help me, God, to do thy will. Help me, Lord, to speak your word today and not mine, dear Heavenly Father. Fill me with your spirit and help me, O oh God, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated this morning. As we look here in Luke chapter number 15, we can see Jesus addressing people with parables. Parables are illustrations that Jesus used of something in the physical to make a relation to something in the spiritual. And if you will look here, what you'll find in verses number 3 through verses number 7 is the parable of the lost sheep. Then if you look in verses number 8 through verses number 10, you'll find the parable of the lost coin. And then in verses number 11 through 32, you find the parable of the prodigal son. It was the lost son, if you wanted to call it that this morning. And each of these parables deals with lostness. Now it certainly could be an illustration to talk about the reconciliation of the Christian into the church, but I don't want to preach that text this morning, and we're going to follow along directly with the Bible and preach on lostness this morning. And what we have is, is if you want to put it like this, you could say the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the love of the Father. And what you can see is, as you can see an escalation in these parables, as in the beginning with the first parable of the lost sheep, the lost sheep was one of 100. So we see a lostness of 1%. And then when we go to the parable of the lost coin, 
What you can find is, is you can find a coin that was one of ten. And you can find 10% lostness in that one. And then when you go to the last parable, you see two sons. And what you find is, is you find a lostness of 50%. So not only do you escalate in the majority or the percentage, but you also escalate in the value of each one of those. As in the value of one sheep compared to a hundred sheep. One coin compared to ten coins. And also the value of one son compared to two sons. And what Jesus is trying to express is, is the degree of love that God has for each and every one of these. In the beginning, if you was to look at the parable of the lost sheep, then what you find is, is you find the seeking shepherd. It's a picture of Jesus Christ leaving heaven and coming to earth to seek and to save that which was lost. It's the, he is the good shepherd is what we call him. It's the shepherd seeking out the lost sheep. And in the second parable of the lost coin, what you find is, is you see a picture of the searching spirit and how that the spirit searched for the coin and that it lighted and looked into the dark places and how the spirit of God lights and looks into the darkness of the heart of man. And in the last parable, what we can see is, is we see a picture of the love of the father to each and every one of these lost things we can see the picture of the love of the Father. And that's what Jesus was trying to illustrate. And that's what Jesus was trying to paint to the people that was sitting around Him. Was that God loves lost people the same as God loves saved people. God rejoices when a sinner comes to repentance. You can see it in all three parables. You can see the rejoicing when they bring home the lost sheep. You can see the rejoicing when they find the lost coin. And then lastly, you can see the rejoicing of the Father when the lost son returns home. So this morning, if I could, I just want to give you some things that is pointed out and brought to attention in this parable this morning. I don't plan on being too long this morning, but I do have about two or three pages of notes. So you all just bear with me this morning. Don't say, Brother Joe, I'm getting hungry this morning. I don't want to hear that because I was out of Cheerios and I only had about a quarter of bowl. So I'm just as hungry as you all are. And I got a bigger tank to fill. All right. So let's get underway this morning. I just want to show you a few things this morning. The first thing I noticed and that I seen that I want to bring to your attention is the tragedy that this parable brings out is the tragedy of sin. The tragedy of sin. We can see two things in the tragedy of sin. We can see sin in the mental state or sin's mentality. And then we can see sin's manifestation. And first of all, I want us to look this morning in the tragedy of sin as sin begins to overrun this young man's life, we're going to look at the mental state and how sin affected his mentality this morning. First of all, I want you to notice what we can't see. That's kind of hard to notice what we can't see. But we know that this young man makes a demand of his father here in just a moment. We know that he asks his father for a, a sum of money, and I'm going to get on with that in just a minute. And we know that this young man goes out and how he lives after he gets that sum of money. The Bible says with riotous living. It says with harlots. It says that he wasted it. So before all of this ever began, though, something else had to take place. And for sin to do things to people, what we have to realize is, is the, tr the, the, the tragedy of sin, but the trickery of sin and covetousness. Covetousness. You can see it in the last of the commandments. It says, thou shalt not covet. Covet is when we look at something and we desire to have it greatly. And when that covetousness overtakes us, then sin is born in our heart. And somewhere along the line, this young man either saw those harlots and coveted them, 
He saw that lifestyle and coveted it. Or he saw freedom and coveted it. But he has a covetousness in him. And sin begins to develop. Remember, if you will, in your Bible, in the book of Genesis. It was Eve. What did she do before anything else with the fruit? She saw it. It was a sin with the eyes. Remember Samson in your Bible. Each sin that Samson did in the Bible, the first thing he did was he saw and he saw and he saw. And the song that little kids sing has a lot of great truth to it when they sing that song. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down with love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful today with what you look upon. Be careful today with what you look at because the old devil might just be hanging down something in front of you trying to get you to have a little gander at it. Maybe it's a little bit of look too long. Maybe it's a little bit of clothes that are too short or too revealing. Maybe it's someone who's too handsome. Maybe it's a black top driveway. Maybe it's a new vehicle. Maybe whatever it is today. Maybe it's freedom of life. But whatever it is today, I just want to say something to you today. Be careful what you look upon because it enters into the mind. So this son, we see in his mentality, sin's development. And then we see sin's demand. The next thing that he does is, is he tells his father, give me, give me. Now, stop and just think about this just for a moment. A lot of you today may be familiar with inheritance. Perhaps you inherited something in your life. But most of the time when we inherit something, somebody else has passed away. Am I right? Am I thinking about that today? Well, so was true in those days as well. But this son is demanding his inheritance before his father has ever passed away. And he's wanting his third. He was the second son, so he was able to receive a third. And he asked for a third of his father's wealth. We don't know if his father gave it to him monetarily. We don't know if the father had land and then he had to sell it and give it to him monetarily. But he demanded it. He said, Father, give me. Give me. He wants it. He wants it now. He's like old J.G. Wentworth. It's my money and I want it now. Y'all don't watch much TV, do you? That's good. Hey, Y'all stay right there, okay? He wants his money. Now, he wants his stimulus check. No. Uh, he wants his money. He's saying, give me. Look at that. Give me. He's making a demand to his father. Give me my inheritance. And then we see sin's disposition. Now, look at how sad this is. I, and this never really dawned on me until last night when I was preparing and, and I, I made a, a post about it. It said, the younger son wanted what the father could give him. But he didn't want the father. He wanted what the father could give him. But he didn't want the father. Ain't that sad? He was saying, Dad, give me my inheritance. And here's why he was saying it. So I can leave. Give me what you've earned. Give me what you've worked for so that I can leave you. Think about that just for a moment. You parents, think how sad that would make you today if your children demanded their inheritance just so they could leave. He cared nothing for the Father. He only cared for the Father's blessings. And that set my little mind to wondering just a little bit how many people today there are in the world how I used to be in the same ideology. I wanted all the blessings of God, but I did not want God. I wanted the blessings of the Father, but I wanted nothing to do with God. I wanted the blessings of God. I wanted happiness in my heart. I wanted health, wealth, and prosperity. But I wanted nothing to do with God Himself. And there's a lot of people out in the world today, and they're lost people. And I was once one of them as well, who's living their life, and they're wanting the blessings of God to come down upon them. They want a happy home. They want a happy life. They want children. They want all these 
good things to come to them. How many of you know that good things only come from above? And the good thing, they want God's blessings to rain down upon them, but they don't want nothing to do with God. That's sin's mentality. Next we see sin's manifestation. How many of you know whatever is born in the heart is birthed in the hands? Or I can say it like this. It's conceived in the heart and it's birthed through the hands. In other words, when you think something, eventually you do it. So lo and behold, he's struggling with sin. He tells his father to give me. We see his disposition, his demand. But then when we see the manifestation of sin, the first thing we see that sin brings is, is sin brings the division of the family. Look at what your Bible says. After he got the money, what did he do? He goes into a far country. As soon as he receives his inheritance, he leaves. He goes away. Because let me just say something to you today, friends. The first thing that sin will do to anybody is sin will divide. I don't care if you're two years old or 200 years old today. Sin has divided or sin will divide you. It will separate you from God. Adam and Eve, when they was in the garden and they sinned and they eat of the tree of the fruit of the... Uh, they eat of the tree, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They died right then and right there spiritually. They were separated from God. This young man is separating himself from his father, and it's to help us to understand the separation that people go through when they sin. And today, if you're here or if you're under the sound of my voice and you haven't repented to God, asked Him to forgive you of your sin, being born again, you're separated from God. You say, Brother Joe, I'm in the church house. It doesn't matter. Spiritually, you're separated from God. And that's what Jesus is trying to draw us a picture of is the separation of the family when the son goes into the far country. Now, not only do we see the division that sin brings to the family, but we see the devastation that sin brings to the father. Look at what happens. The father says this of his son later on in the text. He says, this is my son that was dead. This was my son that was lost. It's not the fact that the father counted the son as dead to him. No, it's the fact that the father did not know where the son was. The son never returned to the father. The son, I don't guess he ever wrote any letters. He didn't drop by and say, Dad, how you doing? And it might have been easier. I don't know, it might have been easier for the man to think that something terrible had happened to his son. And that he was... Son it, think about it like this, man. Wouldn't it be easier to think about that your son was dead than to think that he's still alive and doesn't love you? You see, I, I think that's the way that God has to look down from heaven once in a while and think to himself, well, I gave him life. I've gave them the breath to breathe. I've gave them all these blessings in life and they won't even acknowledge that I'm alive. But how many of you know today that if you haven't been born again, then your Bible, the Bible says that you're dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead. Half dead. Your soul is separated. Therefore, it is dead. Dead. And if it dies in that dead state, if you physically die with a separated soul from God, then that soul will be eternally separated from God in hell and damnation forever. We see the son, the devastation of the father. But then we see the degradation that sin brings. The degradation of the son. Look at what happens to him. Well, as soon as he gets away from his father's house, he changes and he goes into riotous living. Uh, he's drinking and carrying on with his friends or his so-called friends that he has. He's living how he wants to live. I guess he's saying it's my body and I can do with it as I please. 
It's my money and I can do with it as I please. We can see that he's doing ever how he wants to do. We can also see later on in the text somehow the older brother knew that he was even sleeping around with harlots, so to speak. So now his morality, his morality has turned to immorality because he's going down the path of sin. It was conceived in his mind. It was born through his hands. It's divided him from his father. It's devastated his father. And now it's degrading his life. He's not the person that he used to be. He's doing things that he used to didn't do. And can I just stop and say for just a moment that sin will do the same to anybody. It can take the sweetest little child that was raised in church that uh, never missed a Sunday with mom and dad and when they get out into the world on their own, sin can turn them upside down, twist them around. It can do all sorts of terrible things. Sin will take you further than you want to go and it will charge you more than you want to pay. And this son's about to learn this right here. Well, what did he do? Well, the first thing he did was is he lived riotously. He wasted or degraded the person that he was and then he wasted his prosperity. The prosperity of his father that was given to him. He wasted it. In other words, he just took the money and he just kind of threw it around. And he wasted it. And you know, I... When I, when I studied on that, I thought about this this morning or last night about wasting and how a lot of people today, we used to say this, and perhaps you all can help me out this morning. Some of you all are my age today, maybe just a little older. You all might have heard it too. I don't know. But used to when I was in high school and when I was in college, when we went to a party or something like that and someone would show up overly intoxicated or overly high on drugs, we used to say that they were wasted. Oh, they were so wasted when they come into that party. That person was really wasted. But in our text today, when we see the wasting of it, we have to stop and think about how people are wasting their lives. People are wasting the blessings of their father. Every time, here you all help me do this this morning. Look at me. Everybody sit up and look at me. Now open your mouth and go, <gasps> Hey, you just took a breath. You just breathed in oxygen and you exhaled carbon dioxide. How many of you know today that that oxygen was given to you from God? It's a blessing of God. But these people are living today who's wasting. Now, I'm not talking about the type of person they are. Y'all help me out here this morning. But they're wasting oxygen in the fact that they're using every breath to swear with. They're using breath to curse the name of God. They're drawing God's air into their lungs and they're wasting God's air out of their lungs. They're wasting their lives. They're wasting their minds. There's people today who are absolutely brilliant in mind and don't know God and refuse to accept Him and living their lives as fools. They're wasting what God's given them. There's people out there today who are wasting the blessings of God. They're wasting. There's people out there today who can do magnificent things. There's craftsmen in this world today. How many of you know that's a blessing from God? Amen. And they're wasting those things. They're not giving God a bit of a glory. There's people out there who can sing like a bird. These country music singers, these rock and roll singers, some of them can really, really sing. And they're really, really talented. But instead, they're using it for pervertedness. They're using it to tear down instead of to build up. There's people out there today who have children. That is, How many of you know that children are a blessing from God? But they're wasting their children. They're abandoning their children. They're not even looking at their kids. Some are tearing them from the womb before they're even being born. 
They're wasting them. People's wasting their lives. I wasted my life for 24 years. And then I did nothing for God with my life. I wasted it. And today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then you're wasting your life. You say, I'm doing good things. It doesn't matter. If you die, you'll die and go to hell. Unless you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. This young man, he wasted it. I want to show you what sin did to him. It turned him from a son. He was, when he left, he was a father's son, wasn't he? But in the end, we see him as a servant feeding pigs. He had, he left, he had a home. But we find him homeless. He was happy. And he went to hunger. He was adored. And he went to abandoned. And he was wealthy. And he went to want. And if it couldn't get no worse, this young man is fixing to get down on his hands and his knees. And he's fixing to eat with pigs. And there couldn't have been no more degrading thing to a Jewish person than to eat with pigs. But there's a lot of people today who's living off the trash of the world when they could be feasting at God's table. Amen. The tragedy of sin, but then we see a change and we begin to see the triumph of love. The triumph of love. Let me just show you a few things this morning. i got to hurry up. I want you to notice something in this text. And I believe that this may be one of the most important parts of this text. And it's right here in verse number 17. When it says, and when he came to himself. Amen. Now, somehow or another, this feller... He's get, he, he's done wasted all his father's wealth. He's done hired himself on as a servant. And it's apparently to a Gentile person because they own hogs. He's out there feeding hogs. Nothing could be more degrading to a Jewish man. And now he's getting ready to eat with the hogs. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere comes, Hey! Wake up! light comes on and he says what am I doing and you see that could not have happened without the work of the spirit of God if God had wanted to he could have left him in the hog pen amen but he allowed him to open his eyes and to see what he became. Let me say this and I, and I move on. No one will ever be saved without realizing where they're at. Amen. And it's the work of the Holy Ghost of God that helps us to realize where we're at. It's the preaching of the gospel that helps people to realize that they need a Savior. It's the Ten Commandments that help us to understand that we're sinners in need of salvation. It's the cross of Calvary that helps us to understand that we're sinners in need of a Savior. We need to preach the blood. We need to preach repentance. We need to preach sin because people need to understand that there's a better way to to life and the way that you're living right now is going to take you straight down the path of hell and we need the inspiration of the Holy Ghost of God to open people's eyes and to help them have some realization and he realizes he comes to himself and he says what am I doing and he begins to be in remorse because he remembers home and he says I'm going to go back to my dad Praise God, I'd go right there. He's going to go back to his dad. And he's going to tell his dad, Dad, I'm not worthy to be called your son no more. Make me as a servant. You know what that is? That's repentance. He realizes 
who He is, where He come from. He remembers the blessings of His Father. He wants to return and He begins to have repentance in His heart. It's a change of direction. He didn't say, Dad, I'm sorry, and then kept eating with the hogs. He didn't stay in the hog pen. No, He got up out of there and He split, dab, slapped, foot and headed for home. Amen. Because He wanted to return. He wanted to get out of there. He didn't want to be in that place anymore. Man, I got great news. Today, if you're tired of that place, there's a better place. Amen. Amen. We see the son's repentance, and then we see the son's return. He returns home. <clears throat> Man, I, I'd have been afraid to get home. I'd have been afraid my dad was going to beat me. And this boy here was too, wasn't he? He was afraid his dad was going to disown him. He didn't know if his dad would even want anything to do with him. But that's where we see the, the gratefulness. We see the grace of the Spirit to begin with. Then we see the gratefulness of the Father. We see his Father's response. Look what it says in verse number 20. And he arose and came to his Father. But, there's that word, conjunction, junction, what's your function? But, when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. I don't know why. And I can't tell you why. I guess it's just because of the way I was raised. I don't know. But I remember sitting on my papa's porch. And sitting in the swing. And looking down Rock Camp Road. And every time I read this story. I think about looking down Rock Camp Road. And I just can see. As plain as day. The father sitting on the porch. And looking down the road. I know it probably didn't happen like that. But that's the way it's got to happen up here for me. Okay. And he's looking down the road. And he sees this tattered individual coming. You see, you got to realize just for a moment that I believe Dad was standing, standing or sitting or looking. I believe he was watching every day for the sun. I wonder if he got up in the morning and didn't pull the curtains back and say to himself, is my son, well, praise God, is my son home? I just wonder if he didn't open the door and say, is my son home today? I just wonder if every day at noontime before he ate lunch, if he didn't look around to see if he saw his son anywhere. I wonder if he laid down before he went to bed at night, if he didn't look down the road one more time to see his son. But think about the joy of the father, the happiness that it brought, the day that he looked down the road, the day that he saw the son returning. Praise God. Dad didn't stand around. Dad didn't say here comes the filthy wretched thing. Dad didn't say here comes the wasteful righteous person. No, the dad fleet footed it to the son. As fast as he could go, he ran to meet him. And praise God, how many of you know that's the way God will meet you today? Amen. He'll meet you that fast. He'll meet you that quick. Before you ever come to him, God will get to you. Look what he does. We see the excitements of his steps. We see the embrace of his son. Think where this boy's been. He's been in a hog pen. When you've been in a hog pen, you stink like a hog. But it didn't matter to his dad. It didn't matter to his dad at all. He fell upon his son's neck. He embraced him and he began to kiss him. That's kissing him upon the cheek. It was a sign of uh, salutation or a sign of welcoming, a sign of love. He kissed him. How many of you know today? You all help me out now, you parents today. It don't matter how dirty their face is. It don't matter how much snot they got running down their face. When they pucker them little lips up and look up at you, you're going to give them some sugar. Amen? And you're glad to get it. Am I right about it today? How many of you love to kiss your babies? Hey, how many would still kiss them, but they're too big and won't let you no more? I know what you're talking about today. My mama would have kissed me. She would have kissed me when I was 35 years old, right out in public. She'd have grabbed me and kissed me if I had a letter. But I got you know why she did that? Because she loved me, praise God. Amen. And the reason he's running to his sons because he loved him. The reason he's embraced him because he loved him. The reason he ran to him is because he loved him. He loved him, he loved him, he loved him. And what Jesus is trying to get across to us this morning is this. God loves you. I want you to notice something else that the father did. When the son got there and he told him, he says, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. The father never said a word about the inheritance. The father never said a word 
about the right to living. The father never said anything about where the son had been. You want to know why? Because he was just glad to have his son. He excused his sin. Friends, let me say something to you today. i got to hurry along. I'm not going to make it to my next big point. I'm going to get these little ones in and I'm going to be done. Fix your eyes on me for one moment. I know some of you is preoccupied. Listen to me. Doesn't matter what you've done. God's love is big enough to save you today. He'll excuse every sin you've ever committed. He did it by paying for your sins on Calvary. Jesus can save you today no matter what you've done. He doesn't expect you to stay in the hog pen. But he does expect you to repent and return to Him. And today, if you ask God to forgive you, you'll mean it in your heart, He'll save you from your sins. He won't bring them back up. The Bible says that He'll cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. How far is the east from the west? Well, as that song says, it's from one nail-scarred hand to the other. It's that far right there. The east can never touch the west. That's how far God will cast your sin. The Bible says that God will put your sin into the sea of forgetfulness. He'll never remember them anymore. You may remember them, but God won't. And He's the one that matters. Then we see the son's restoration. When he comes home, the father takes the son and he puts the robe upon him. He takes the old dirty clothes he'd had in the hog pen and he puts a robe upon him. And that helps us to see God robing us with righteousness today. We may have been done terrible things in our life. We may have said terrible things. We may have done awful things. You've probably got things right now in your mind that you've done that you would never let anybody in here know. And believe me, I don't want to know what they are. But God knows what they are. But let me just tell you this today. He's cast them from the east as far as the west. If you'll repent. He's robed you in righteousness. He's put a ring upon your hand. He's put shoes upon your feet. That was a sign that you're no longer a servant, but you're a son. And then lastly, it tells us that there's rejoicing. Kill the fatted calf. And they rejoice. They celebrate. Because this son that was dead is alive again. I'm going to end there and I'm not going to preach this last point today. I'll just share with you this illustration. Perhaps some of you all have heard it. I don't know. But I just feel led to do it. It's just a story. There's no truth in it. But it's a good illustration to this illustration. It just helps us to see how much God loves us, I think. There was a man one time on a train. And he was riding on that train. I know some of y'all have heard this. He was riding on that train. And he was sitting directly across from another individual. And he could see that the young man was troubled. And he began talking to him and asking him what was troubling him. He said, this train goes past the house that I used to live in. He said, I haven't been home in a long time. He said, I had a fight with my father. He said, and we, I left on bad terms. He said, I haven't spoken to my father and my mother in years. He said, but I wrote them a letter and told them I was sorry for what I'd done. And he told them that if I was, I would ride this train and as it goes past their house, that if they would, if they would just tie a white ribbon in the tree behind the house, then I would know that it was okay to come home. And he said, we're nearing my house now. And he said, if you would, would you just look out the window? He said, I can't bear to look. He said, but would you look out the window for me? 
And he said, would you see if there's a white ribbon in the tree behind the house? And he gave him a description of the house. The man looked out the window. And as the train passed the house, the man began to smile. The son said, what did you see? He said, was there a ribbon in the tree? He said, there was not only a ribbon in the tree, but he said, the whole tree was covered in white ribbons. And he said, there was a man and a woman out back waving a big white sheet. And he said, they're telling you to come on. Praise God, it did good. You see, that's what God does for you. He lets you know that He loves you. And He gives you a symbol today to help you to understand it. And it's the cross of Calvary. Jesus Christ died so that you can return to God. You may be sitting here today and you've never repented of your sin. You're as lost as a coot in a hailstorm and you're on your way to hell. But let me tell you something today. Believe me today because I'm telling you today that Jesus can save you. He can change your life. He can turn you around. He died for you. He loves you. And He's waiting on you to come home to Him. Will you come home to Jesus today? Let's all stand. Let's all stand.